Hi guys, it's Rob Flux here from Property Developer Network, coming to you for another Sunday session. This week, we've got a very special event. We've got our Town Planner Town Hall, uh, where I've got five different town planners from around the country trying to answer all the questions as to what's happening in and around our environments. And uh, it's your ability to interrogate them uh, and find out what's actually happening in their network. So uh, in no particular order, we've got uh, Melody Ellis from Change of Plan in Victoria. We've also got Paul Jemison from Gem Plan in Victoria. In Queensland, we've got Vu Nguyen and Craig Christie, who is fashionably late at this moment in time, but I'm sure will join us any moment in, uh, as we go. And from New South Wales, we've got Adam Piper from Piper Planning. So uh, with that said, I am going to uh, welcome everybody. So. Uh, Folks, say hello to our, to our audience. Um, so I might start with you, Melanie, uh, I guess ladies first. So tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your business, what your specialty is, the areas that you concentrate on, uh, and then we'll uh, move down to the gentleman. Certainly, so change of plan. Uh, I've been operating the business for just over 10 years now. And um, our focus is on smaller residential and business um, industrial and commercial developments. We're located in southeastern suburbs of Melbourne, so I do a lot of work in the southeastern suburbs uh, from the Mornington Peninsula all the way up to uh, Port Phillip and around uh, Glenara, Casey, uh, Monash, to name a few. Awesome, very good. And also from Victoria, we've got Paul Jemison from Gemplan. So, Paul, uh, what about yourself, your areas of specialty, and uh, the, I guess, uh, areas and, and development strategies you concentrate on. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm also based in uh, the southern suburbs of Melbourne, so in Bentley, and uh, I focus on, I guess, a, a broad brush of planning from residential, industrial, commercial, uh, and have a background in also in strategic work and master planning as well. Um, I suppose more recently, my focus has been since uh, building my own business from about 2017. It's just been largely on residential in these uh, in the you know the around the surrounding suburbs, as well as um, continuing to work for a couple of um, major commercial businesses and uh, doing work around the country trying to uh, help them. So uh, I tend to vary quite a bit. Um, and also have quite a background in industrial uh, industrial work, industrial development applications as well. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we'll work up the East Coast. So uh, Adam Piper from Piper Planning, tell us a little bit about yourselves and your areas of expertise, mate. You are muted, Adam. You're gonna have to unmute yourself, mate. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now, Rob? Yeah, go for it, mate. Sorry about that. <laughs> the beauties of life. The beauties of life. Hi, everyone. My name's Adam Piper. My business is Piper Planning. Uh, we've been operating in Newcastle and the Hunter region uh, for about 10 years now. Um, our specialist focus is uh, medium density residential development, mainly in the Newcastle local government area and the Lake Macquarie local government areas. Uh, but like all good consultants, we work anywhere. Um, the New South Wales planning system uh, has a aspect to it that's um, reasonably uniform right throughout the state. And so we can pretty well operate effectively anywhere in the state. And we do, um, yeah, so our main focus is resi, but we do a fair bit of commercial and industrial as well. Yeah, the, the rest of us are quite envious of the New South Wales planning system. I think with the, the uniformity of, uh, I guess, I guess the zonings and the and the terminologies and the the actual rules themselves, the framework uh, consistent across the state, uh, that would be very advantageous for the rest of the country. Uh, I noticed that South Australia is going through a reform right now to do exactly that. So, yeah, look, it happened a few years ago, and it, it, it it's made a world of difference. Certainly, um, Melanie indicated before uh, we went live there. Um, knowing peculiarities within different local government areas, how people interpret rules helps. Uh, and you certainly do get an element of that, but still there is that consistency in structure and framework. So it, it's it's quite good. Very good. Uh, and I guess further up the East Coast, we've got uh, Vu Nguyen from uh, Town Planning Alliance. Vu, tell us about yourselves and what you specialise in. Right. 
Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having us. Uh, well, my practice, uh, much like everyone else here, is now in its 13th year. Uh, I had the pleasure of setting up practice on the eve of the GFC. So um, a lot of lessons learnt back then we can reapply now. Uh, what we, uh, We're located in a suburb called East Brisbane, which is about one and a half k's from the CBD as a crow flies. Uh, our work is very diverse. Uh, I explained to someone most recently in the last 12 months, our smallest project was an application to take a door out of a heritage house to replace it with bifolds. And our largest application was a 600 lot land subdivision and we do everything else in between. Uh, and that's probably more reflective of our client group. Uh, but we find that the process is generally the same regardless of the size and scale of it. Uh, so, yep, we, uh, much like Adam said, have car will travel uh, geographically we uh, queensland is very much like new south wales where the state has mandated consistent land use definitions and whatnot so the skeletons and the bones of each planning scheme are generally consistent which does allow us to move up and down throughout the state pretty easily very good uh, and last but not least uh the fashionably late craig christie from asi planning uh craig I could see you're a little bit technically challenged mate but uh welcome for finally making it uh, tell us a bit about ASI planning, mate. Uh, you are muted, my friend. <laughs> um, thank you. So ASI planning, we're, uh, we've been around for nearly 10 years. Um, we primarily work with smaller scale and first time property developers, with most of our work being um, Brisbane and Southeast Queensland. Um, we lodge a really high, really high number of um, risk smart applications, which are Typically, people doing subdivisions or multiple dwelling unit projects, which are uh, are of a smaller scale. So that's kind of our specialty, and uh, and they're the people we like to work with. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for telling us about yourselves. Uh, I've got a couple of questions to get the ball rolling, but the the whole intent of this is to get some questions from the audience. So uh, I guess giving everyone a bit of a pre warning to get your questions into the chat window, uh, and in the meantime, I'll ask a couple as we come through. So. Over these last couple of months, folks, um, how have we been seeing, I guess, the COVID-19 impact on your business with regards to clients? Uh, you know, have they dropped the number of applications coming through to you or are you seeing uh, an increase with people, I guess, trying to take advantage of things or how are we seeing that? We might do that in reverse order. So, Craig, with you first, mate. Yeah, so first of all, you could hear a pin drop for two weeks. I'm like, well, we're stuffed. We're not getting any phone calls. Nothing's going on. I think everyone everyone was fairly shell-shocked. Um, and to my surprise, things picked up. Literally, you know, two weeks after the the, 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 the worst, you know, the, when everything got shut down. Uh, in our last four or five weeks, are probably, well, not probably, they have been bigger than the four or five weeks, four or five weeks prior to that. Um, an example would be on Friday, a phone call from a client who said I was doing some research about doing a subdivision uh, about two years ago. But now that I know there's a $25,000 grant, I want to try and rush the subdivision through as quickly as possible. So we're getting people who are um, optimistic about the uh, the marketplace. And um, there's a lot of positivity, which uh, yeah, it still surprises me a little bit, but people are very positive about the, uh, the prospects of getting involved and doing developing. So yeah, we've been busy. Very good. We'll see if that's consistent across the country. So, Vu, uh, you next, mate. Yeah, I guess the pattern we saw is not much different to Craig. That first two weeks was um, was a bit uh, uncertain, dare I say. But what I've noticed is that our clients who are generally full-time career developers are a very resilient mob. You know, they can't just leave the sector and go become a barista. So they've had to spend the last few weeks I think the new look term these days is pivoting their business, dare I say. So what we've seen is a lot of guys or a lot of developer clients now are look, heading in a different direction. They're looking for products that uh, have an emphasis on speed to the marketplace rather than yield. So we're getting asked questions. We're not just getting asked the usual question of, can you get this approved? We're getting two questions now, which is, can you get this approved? And can you get it approved in two months? as opposed to, can you get it approved? Uh, so the question of speed is equally important as the question of yield. And we're watching our developer clients uh, change their processes to head towards that process now. Very good. Uh, and Adam, yourself, what are you saying in uh, New South Wales, mate? Yeah, look, very similar to the, the two other examples there. Um, it was very quiet 
for a couple of weeks. Luckily, we had a, a pretty reasonable pipeline of work. Um, it's been really sporadic of late. Uh, either the phone will ring all day, flat out, or we won't hear much at all, which is, it's hard to get a handle on. But my read on it, I think people are sensing opportunities and getting organised. So we're doing more feasibility reviews than what we would normally do. Um, assisting people um, with their due diligence. So that correlates to me, to them thinking that there's going to be good buyers out there. So it hasn't stopped. Um, people that are positive and enthusiastic are getting all their ducks lined up, ready to go. So look, I, I think we'll, we'll grind along uh, and we'll get through it, but it's not, it, it's not outrageously flat out and it's not dead. Um, but yeah, there's a sense that people are out there looking around. Very good. And uh, Paul, yourself over in Victoria? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. I guess the, the first thing I, um, I felt personally is that a couple of key commercial clients pretty much put a freeze on Capital Works, which has endured. So that's been, I suppose, the bad news for my, my own business in the sense that they're still waiting for greater confidence to be able to keep going with capital projects and capital spending. So, um, so I'm hoping that that will actually start to reemerge and there is some sign of that. Um, from a residential perspective, it's been really quite pro um, positive. Uh, so immediately after COVID, there was very strong fearful you know, fear that it was everything, it was going to stop, but it didn't. And in fact, if the residential for me has sustained, inquiries have increased and um, and even the, I guess, the whole process of getting work through that process, uh, that period has actually been pretty, uh, pretty reasonable. So it's, I, I think the promising thing for me is that it's, um, it's, we're continuing to see quite a lot of interest in, in the area from, uh, as I said, Brighton through to the peninsula. Um, I think people were taking advantage of the, the quieter times that council, well, I thought they'd have, but uh, to get, you know, to get through the permit process. Um, and we can talk about that, in, I guess, in a minute, just about um, how the councils are going. But it's reflected on the fact that, like a couple of the other guys there, it's, that there has been ongoing, a lot of ongoing interest. And I think people are still seeing it as a, as a time to, um, yeah, reset and also reflect on opportunities that they haven't in the, done in the past. Uh, so that's been promising and we've certainly encouraged that as well to, it's a good time to get permits. And um, I think that's really true. Very good. And last but not least, Melanie. Sure, okay. Um, thanks Rob. My, I guess my experiences are probably similar to, to everyone else's. It certainly did go pretty quiet in terms of new inquiries um, initially, uh, but, because of planning and, and the nature of it being for months, you know, we we're still busy doing work. Uh, and so it was a good opportunity to really get, um, you know, to focus on, on that. Um, but since, um, you know, since that really quiet period, I noticed that in particular, there was a lot more, um, it, there was less inquiries, but they were of a lot more robust and, and um, worthwhile nature. So less fluff, I guess you could say. Uh, and um, yeah, like some of the other guys, I think that, um, yeah, people are seeing it as an opportunity to just, you know, to be ready when uh, things are, um, you know, back back in operation. I've even got a client who, who's doing gyms and so he's, you know, seeing it, he's still proceeding. He's seeing, you know, the other side um, of, um, of Victoria's restrictions and, um, you know, it's just an opportunity to keep, to keep pursuing the planning applications um, while we wait for everything to be um, to be reopened. Yeah, very good. So that's from the client side. What about, uh, what are we seeing the impacts from council with many councils working from home and that sort of thing? Are we seeing the, uh, the approval timelines uh, drag out at all or have we largely found councils are keeping up with the applications coming through seeing as how everything slowed down? Um, in no particular order, I'll, I'll pick on Paul and then Adam. Yeah, thanks. Look, because I, I, I alluded to that earlier, um, I gave this some thought over the last couple of days. Uh, basically, I, I think I've seen an overall improved service culture from the councils, and I think there's a fundamental uh, reason for that. The planners aren't dealing with as many um, counter inquiries and phone calls anymore. Um, they're mostly working from home. The ones that I've been dealing with, they're all been working from home. 
And so for me, I've actually seen, a, I think, a more positive feel and response from local government planners. Um, I've spoken to some personally that you'd never usually get much of a conversation out of and then actually they've been going for quite some time and talking about how they're managing their kids and their work and everything else and it's actually been a really good relationship building time mm. for me um, some of the clients or councils that would typically deal with are suddenly are so much under pressure it's actually uh, been refreshing for them to actually be sitting in their office and or at home and just um you're reflecting a bit more. So I think it's actually been quite positive, the response I've seen from councils. And, uh, and you know, I think that they're, they're, they're doing pretty good. Yep. Um, Adam? Yeah, I'd agree um, 100%. We're, we're noticing um, better timeframes, um, improved communication. Um, like Paul mentioned, I think um, people might be less stressed they're, they're more human to deal with. Um, they're um, happy to talk and and facilitate outcomes. I think um, I know Lake Macquarie that we do a lot of work with. Um, they've got a little bit more of a business kind of focus. Um, they've got a business unit that seeks to facilitate um, development and, and business in the local government area. And I think they're articulating uh, the idea that we really need to focus on delivery of good quality um, developments quickly. Um, to, to stimulate the local economy. So it's, it's front of mind. And, and I think the, um, the technology changes that the staff are using um, has facilitated better outcomes, uh, more efficient outcomes. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Craig, what about yourself, mate? You... Yeah, I, um, my experience has been we have had some delays. Um, what I found with council and, and I've actually spoke with planners and, that, and the feedback was if it's a really no brainer and it's going through smoothly, um, then they're going through you know, reasonably the same time periods. Um, but the feedback was when there's a need to have multiple people meetings, when they're trying to organize meetings with engineers or other internal consultants, they're having trouble coordinating those meetings. And as a, as a result of not being able to just walk around and have a chat with an engineer or, or do whatever that could be done in the council offices, um, we're suffering some delays there. So probably the, in summary, the, 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 the easy ones and the, um, the no issue ones are going through pretty similar, probably say a little bit slower still, um, but the more problematic ones, we're definitely seeing some delays going on with those projects. And uh, that, Rob. sorry, I missed that. So I just I'd totally support the internal referral delays. That's been probably the one area where there's just a little bit of delay occurring between yeah the internal specialists. Yeah, which is which is quite um, uh, and understandable uh, completely. But uh, from my world, somehow I'm jamming more into a day because there's no travel time to to coffee shops and there's mm -hmm. no travel time to it's you know get off one meeting and two seconds later you're into another one. So. Uh, I can see both pros and cons in that approach, but uh, Melanie, you seeing similar at your end or? Um, to be honest, for me, it's been fluctuating a bit. So sometimes some of the councils, you know, things are getting done faster, um, you know, much faster than normally, like, you know, put an application in and we were in for advertising a week later, that kind of thing, which in Melbourne is unusual uh, for a unit development. But then on the other side of it, you know, some things are still dragging along um i've got one council who was saying that the uh, advertising process that they're struggling a bit with that because they're all working from home and so the advertising is being done in batches so it was taking you know a couple of extra weeks to process the advertising and have that ready so you know seeing little delays like that but overall um over overall i think i feel like things are probably tracking along about the same in terms of timeframes. Uh, definitely agree that if there's if there's a need for communication with other uh, departments or you know waiting on referrals, that that certainly is dragging things down. Be probably because it's harder for them, you know, maybe it's harder for the planners to to harass the engineer or the the landscape um, department and and get those comments back. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see over the over the the next period as to how things, you know, progress. If, if the numbers of applications um, dwindle a little bit in, in the council, then that should um, alleviate some processing times as well. Yep, and I think the only person we've not heard from this round is Vu, so 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I, I, I don't disagree at all with the, uh, the comments of we've just heard just now. Uh, for me personally, what I've found is that having meetings via Skype, Zoom, Teams is nowhere near as effective with council as you are in person. Uh, in what we do, there's a lot to be said to be able to actually point at a drawing, scribble up a solution, uh, as opposed to trying to verbalise it without being able to draw it on the spot, if that makes sense. So a lot, all of our means with council, we find it aren't anywhere near as effective. And that, that's not council's fault. That's just a byproduct of the environment we're in. We're all trained uh, and conditioned to face-to-face -face interaction with these meetings. Uh, equally, sometimes when you can read someone's body language, you get a better gauge of how you're going in your sales pitch, you know, as opposed to the blank screen in that sense. But uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that we've found, I'll give you the positives and the negatives. I guess the um, starting with the negatives is, and we suffer the same during that process, was a coordination of your sub-consultant. So equally what we've heard here, the coordination of specialists within council uh, has been challenging for them. Uh, from our point of view, the positive, because all phone calls are being rerouted to the numbers at home, uh, dare I say, not that this happens, but our strike rate of getting a council officer answering the phone is a lot higher than it used to be, you know. Uh, but that, that also leads into a, a human interaction. You know, I've got kids, young kids, and they're screaming at home. And council realises you're not just this robot constantly pushing an agenda. You're a human being with a family, uh, which leads to a, 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 a nice interaction, you know. Uh, I'm curious to know people's workspaces, what they look like. So I've had to tidy up my backspace. You know? <laughs> uh, make sure we clean that up before we, we did uh, this today. But uh, yeah, look, it's we we have clients who have asked, who've got some hairy projects, to defer meetings until we're back to face to face because that's the, the they're quite important to be able to actually sit there and thrash out outcomes in person with a set of drawings. That's that's probably the biggest thing we've we've suffered. Yeah, very good. Well, I've got a ton of questions still to go, but I'm noticing questions coming through already from the crowd. So I might uh, defer and see if we can grab uh, one. I've got a question here from Luke. Uh, and an interesting question seems that we've got people from all around the country. So um, do all town planners from different councils, A, know each other uh, and meet to, uh, to communicate? Um, so collaboration and things like that. So I guess within a state, does that happen? And then within interstate, does that happen? Uh, and I'm open to anyone just grabbing the floor on this one. Yes, they do. Um, the, uh, the Victoria's got a pretty strong uh, couple of networks, one through the Victorian Planning Environmental Law Association and also obviously PIA, but there's a very strong, I think, network through those two areas themselves. Plus there's also a local government planners network um, so the consultants, primarily the first two, and the local government planners still meet. But I don't know if they do it as much as they should, um, because the issues are, uh, they really should be getting and staying attuned across as many issues as possible. What about in the other states? So, Vince, yes. sorry, go Yeah, I guess from our point of view, it's hard not to interact with each other because the, you, you go to university together, so you study together, you, you start your careers together. Uh, on top of that, when we take on graduates or, or work under the Queensland process, university students need to rack up a certain amount of uh, work experience before they get their stripes. So, you know, you, you get a lot of students through. So today's student is tomorrow's assessment manager. So it is a small world. Uh, I, I like to think that the Queensland system is very collegial and that we don't mind actually talking to one another and sharing our, our pains or our suggestions. Uh, but having said that, it could always occur more. So... We certainly know each other. We certainly talk to each other, but I think we could also do more of that. Is there any formal associations like what Paul mentioned in Victoria? Or? Uh, the, the Planning Institute does have its chapters, Queensland chapter, and within the Queensland chapter, there's subcommittees and whatnot as well. It's we're, we're often guilty of being too caught up in our own day-to-day -day runnings that we we miss the catch-up this month, or we miss the cat, you know, the, 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 the biannual drinks or whatever it may be, but. Um, uh, I count amongst my closest friends planners who I studied with. You know, it's that's where you form your friendships from from your university days. Uh, beyond the fact that you spend your time drunk and not remembering much, but you do remember, <laughs> you remember your friends from those days. And yeah, we're all still in the same game, and, and we compare notes. And some of us are on the other side of the fence, some of us on this side of the fence. 
some of us work for developers and we just compare notes and it's i think you have to because you if you work in an insular i'm just a consultant and give no regard to what a pl- council or state government planner does or a development manager does you're not going to know where you fit in the process you know yep. so you, you should very good uh adam lastly from yeah new south, um, new south wales we've got the um planning institute of australia that runs regular um training sessions in different areas um you'll see a lot of people from local government and the private sector gather um for information sharing i think um i think the local government planners could collaborate or or meet and talk about different things that they've got going on in their local government areas or interpretation of of some of the planning legislation. Um, I think that could happen more, Uh, but certainly to answer the question, most of us know each other, certainly on a regional basis. Um, Like most planners in Newcastle know each other. Um, Whereas if we went to Sydney, we wouldn't necessarily um, know all of the planners there. Um, But yeah, a a lot of us do know each other. Very good. Um, I'll take another one from the audience. I might actually paraphrase this one and and make it a little bit more general because it was just aimed at one person individually. But uh, I guess government incentives, so I guess the 25K uh, government grant at the moment for, I guess, the building side of things, um, that's definitely for the the ultimate buyer taking on the, uh, I guess, the finished product. But are we seeing a lot more developers wanting to take advantage of applications that are suitable to that kind of exit strategy. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. So uh, to answer the question, I've kind of in somewhat answered it earlier with the uh, example I said about the uh, client that was suddenly active doing their subdivision. Cause ultimately I'll, I'll tell you a personal story. I, I sold a block of land in a hurry when COVID came along and uh, and now I'm kind of kicking myself because I know I'd probably get a better price for it. Now that the the new owner of that property who will build on it will get a twenty five thousand dollar grant, so I think that those two examples sort of relay that yes, um, there is money in the marketplace, and I think I think there is that money, but there's an, there's optimism, and it's like how do you measure optimism? Uh, it's got a it's got a momentum, it's got a power behind it. Um, so that's having big influences on people proceeding. Yep, I think Rob, the devil still sits in the detail on that grant. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, but some of the feedback we're hearing from our clients is certainly from the land subdivision, house building point of view, there's some upkick in that. But in terms of the multi rares, there is some uncertainty whether a pre-sale contract qualifies because the incentives seem to be tied to a building contract, um, not a pre-sale contract. And still, some of that detail is still being worked through the system or dare I say some of our clients are still trying to get their head around that, that information before they jump boots and all in. But on, certainly on the land sub side of things, it has made an improvement. Yeah, so um, along that lines, a little workaround that I've thought of, and it's really up to builders to be uh, open to this idea. Normally, if you've got, say, 10 townhouses, that's a single building contract with the developer. Um, but in order to take advantage of this, are the builders going to be open to 10 smaller contracts um, directly with the landowner? Um, that might be a way out i don't know uh but it creates a lot more complication than you would really want from the builder's perspective um because now you've got 10 people to serve um yeah yeah anyway mortgage registration is a problem in that front as well isn't it 10 mortgages over the one title is a interesting proposition yeah (laughs) um okay uh i've got a question here from chiara which is very general in nature um and I don't really know that it's a planning question, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, They are Melbourne based, uh, but I think this applies everywhere. Um, So they've got a one into four subdivision and they were just wanting to know how they get, uh, I guess, a little more certainty on their estimates from things like uh, services, connections, electrical pits, water, gas, and that sort of thing. I don't really think it's the jurisdiction of yourselves, but um, would be interested in the fact that you're dealing with lots of uh, clients that have these problems as to any insights you can give. Who wants to go? <laughs> I'll, I'll say Melanie because it's a Melbourne question. So Melanie, you can go first. I really, um, I really can't answer that, Rob. I deal very little with subdivisions. Um, yeah, themselves. Oh. So I can't have, yeah, maybe Paul. 
Look, my 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 response would be that it's research. You got to do your research and comparative assessment of other subdivisions. There's there's really so many, I guess, being done um, that I, I would think that if you can find others who have done similar types of projects in similar areas, you'll get those answers pretty quickly. Um, but you do need to be mindful of comparing apples with apples. So if you've got the sub this subdivisions in a particular area, go and see if you can research from someone else who's just been through it. Um, the councils would also, I think, be a pretty good um, resource. I mean, all you can really do is get a, you can ask to speak to a subdivisions officer and they can try and give you some guidance. Um, also potentially probably some civil engineers as well uh, in terms of services connection. But I look, the, you've just got to research it. And um, yeah, it is, it is a step removed past the planning process typically. Um, but this is something I could touch on is that planners are getting asked more and more wider questions like this, Rob. Um, I'm getting more stuff at the front end and also trying to get it to take it further into the building process like report and consent. So it is an interesting question, but it, the answer I would give is research. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I concur with that um, completely. So, uh, and a couple of comments uh, under the covers, I guess, confirming exactly that as well. So, can I, um, can I add, Rob? Can I just yeah, go for it? Yeah, so um, I'm a big believer in mentorship. So, I'm a really firm believer that having surrounding yourself with people who are doing these projects on a regular basis, I um, technically speaking, as a town planner, I, I, I don't specifically mentor my clients, but I tell them, you know, if you've got a rough idea what you think this is going to cost or if you've got some feasibility, I'll, um, I'll kind of look at it out and I won't, you know, I'm technically not going to tell you whether you're right or wrong, but I might say, hey, you need to have a close look at some of these numbers. I'll try to hook them into the people who do know the answers to those. Yeah. But I, the, to me, the real, valuable is, the real value is taking it to someone like yourself, Rob, who's got a lot of experience, who's seen so many of these and just flashing it and saying, hey, check this out. You know, that, that, that to me is where the real value is, is having those network of people around you that, that really de-risk the project. Yeah, thank you, mate. And I guess that's one of the reasons that we have... Uh, this community and this network is uh, so that we can all be support group for each other. Um, I absolutely do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but I guess the the network in and in and of itself is a support group. So, um, and I'd say bring it to things like our meetups and and into our masterminding processes and ask in there. Rob, yeah. I guess my, my opinion might differ a bit to the people in the in the room here. My apologies, guys, but we, we should know what the soft cost is. From start to finish because your government fees don't change your consultant fees don't vary much your infrastructure charges don't change so when you're doing a land subdivision your soft costs we should be able to give a pretty reasonable figure mm -hmm. the variables that cannot be pinned without some further assessment would be if you use a subdivision for instance would be what lies beneath the ground where your sewer pipe is how deep is it where your upgrades are how far are you going to bring it in? And that's where coupled with a civil engineer, we find generally, if we can sit in a room with a civil engineer with the ability to identify the civil cost, uh, overlay that with the soft cost, which we have a pretty good grasp of, you should land at a pretty reasonable accuracy for a subdivision, that is. Um, that, that's, that's certainly my opinion. And I know it differs to what we've heard here, but that's yeah. the way we see it. And I would add to that for, I guess, those doing multi-res um, that your architect and builder would, would certainly be able to add. Most of the time, your architect will be able to give you some high-level estimates of the construction just in, in what they've designed, even if you've not gone out to uh, a specific builder yet. But, um, yeah, try and engage with the, the relevant consultants very early in the process. The um, so are the biggest ones to get across. The, the, top, the nature of the soil and any particular rock, that's going to affect your costs most. So you've got to, like we said, you've got to really understand um, also some of those excess, um, you know, fringe yeah. risks that just got to be I've all, yeah. I've always been a big believer, a believer in the fact that a town planner should be able to tell you what you can do from the ground up and a civil engineer should be able to tell you what you need to do from the ground down. And between the two parties, they should be able to set you on the right track. Yeah. Very good. Uh, well, I'm going to ask a controversial question, folks. Uh, so uh, put your hats on and, and, and brace yourselves. Uh, which councils do you think are the most development friendly around the country? Um, obviously, you can only co um, comment on your particular uh, state level, but I'd be, and conversely, which ones are you finding the most challenging to deal with? 
So who wants who wants to have a crack at that? I'll okay. go first. I'll, oh, he's going to go first. <laughs> yep. yeah. You're welcome to. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I, two spring to mind, mainly because we mostly work with them, but um, Newcastle's statutory provisions are fairly development friendly. They're, they're quite liberal. Um, but in terms of organisational structure and culture, uh, I'd have to say Lake Macquarie Council, um, they're, they're um, very progressive. Um, they've very got really good systems. Um, you guys mentioned before about difficulty with Zoom calls and uh, having communication between professionals. Um, their systems there seem to operate really effectively. And if anything, it's been better through COVID than what it normally is. So, um, yeah, uh, statutory wise, I think Newcastle. Um, culture wise, I think Lake Macquarie. Well, they're, they're your best, Adam. Who's your worst, mate? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> name and shame. Um, look, there's a couple of inner Sydney councils on the North Shore that are pretty horrendous to work with. Yeah. Okay, well, that's politically correct way of not naming, but I'll, Thank I'll you. accept that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about Victoria? Where, do we, where are we seeing uh, that sitting, folks? You go, Melanie. Oh, I go? Okay. Um, uh, to a large extent, to be honest, it is very much um, each council has areas where it prefers development and areas where it doesn't. So depends, you know, like, so I guess the first thing is if, you, if you're working with them in terms of what their preferences are, then that always makes things a lot easier. Uh, certainly some of the... Um, some of the inner city councils can be horrifically slow. Um, and, you know, if, if there's, if there's, you know, ones that have a lot of heritage or, um, I don't know, just conservatism, uh, that can make things, um, you know, uh, difficult. Uh, I'm thinking at the moment Yarra Council still seems to be the, the only council who are still requiring us to mail applications not have an online portal, uh, which is frustrating in the extreme. Um, also, I guess in terms of difficult councils from a development perspective would be Mornington. Uh, they have kind of gone out um, on a rogue sort of, they're not quite, they're not really metropolitan Melbourne, but um, they've, you know, put in some fairly um, stringent controls of their own that, that aren't in the planning scheme. And so they're refusing a lot of applications. So um, yeah, I wouldn't really call them development friendly at the moment. You're referring to the Jemana Township stuff, Melanie? Uh, well, I'm just referring to the, the, the minimum subdivision size that they're wanting in most of Mornington um, in, the, in the township area. So yeah. Sorry, the township, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, well, uh, Rob, sorry, can I make a comment um, in regards to this? Uh, best and worst is, to me, look, I've, I've done, I've got a national client, which is commercial, and I recently had an excellent ex and outstanding experience with Bunbury Council in, in WA. They were, you know, the guy I dealt with there was fantastic, couldn't help more to get you know, direction, because it was pre-application advice, but he couldn't also help more to try and get that to actually encourage my applicant, my applicant to get into a particular premises and I just want to mention that when you get service like this this particular person gave me in the council and he also involved involved his team leader it was so refreshing and it was really welcome um, I've found that some of the growth areas are a bit more pro-development but they they can be really complex particularly with a lot of levies and and things like that um, but equally I would also say that so, uh, there's quite a few councils that have been going through service improvement, culture improvements. Um, you know, Bayside's been through it and that's been, and that's for them worked really well and it's reflected in some really good outcomes. Um, whereas I think a, a few other councils, I'll, I'll name Kingston, who um, have also done some similar uh, work in that regard, but they're still, they're still, I think, got some way to go. And the last thing I would just say is that I believe there's a very big difference between an experienced planner and an inexperienced planner. And I find that the experienced planners are the best to deal with. Uh, they get development, they've been through a lot more, they know where you're heading with particular questions. Uh, whereas I find that, and, and with all due respect to those who have only been in the industry for 
or in their job for a year or two, the more inexperienced players are much more technically by the book. It's not to say the experienced ones aren't by the book. It's just that they know where you're heading and what you need to know and where you need to go. Whereas the less experienced, they, yeah, they're a lot less flexible and they really don't read between the lines. So I think it's just important to understand when our, our, um, our developers out there and aspiring developers are dealing with their consultants and counsellors to try and get, do what they can to get the best people. Yeah, very good. And Queensland, gents? Do you want to go first, Craig? Do you want me to go? Okay. Yeah, great. So um, in probably about three or four years ago, I can't remember what it was, Morton Bay's planning scheme changed. And as a result, we went from virtually doing very little work in Morton Bay to doing a lot more. So in summary, Morton Bay are pro-development by their planning scheme. Um, their refusal rate is extraordinarily low. Um, to work with as a council, they're a bit slow in my experience. And also uh, we have bad habits where they approve things, but they condition them to the point where it's so badly conditioned that the approval isn't that it's, it's just a, it's, 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 approval. it's, a, it's an approval that still needs more work. And I just wish they would discuss it with us before they put some, some of these conditions on. Uh, so Brisbane historically were great to work with, um, but in more in, in recent times, I, would, I wouldn't even say more recent times, probably about uh, pretty much the um, the Brisbane blueprint days even earlier, um, everything's become more and more difficult. So um, still really like working with them, but um, just because a, pro a project may have been approved under the plain, same planning scheme, same circumstances two or three years ago, and I, I'm still cautious about expecting the same result now. And that's reflective of some of the changes to the scheme with car parking rates and the like. So um, uh, Logan, I probably think Logan's is kind of happy in between, um, whereby they're reasonably pro development, they're good to work with, and they're getting things through reasonably quickly. Um, so we, we do a little bit of work in Redlands, never really enjoy working out there much um, through timeframes mainly. Uh, and Ipswich, Ipswich are def definitely like Ipswich, great. I, I don't know, tell me about Ipswich planners, they're really. They're really earthy planners. I really like working with them um, and they're very personable. So um, we'd like doing work out there, but probably the movers in my mind right now are in Morton Bay, as far as opportunities go. And as far as working with a council, may not be the fastest, but very pro development. Yeah, very good. Luke? I guess, yeah, if I could add to that, the, um, let's talk about the, the pro, or let's go on positive councils. We found Logan City Council has a very positive attitude towards development. Uh, I, I, I highlight that by we recently did a land subdivision of 200 lots through the RISMART process. That's a five-day approval for 200 lots. Uh, yeah. And that was a commitment from council at the outset. And to be fair, there was four months of discussions with them beforehand. But at the outset, they said, we want this through this fast track process. We will work with you. And they corralled their teams together, engineers, ecologists, and we got there. So, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough of that process. If you talk process, we find Gold Coast City Council are very good as well. Um, they do stick to process and they honour process. So we did a retirement village where we did two pre-lodgements and the outcome was an approval that was very much similar to what we lodged because they honoured those uh, performance outcomes that we agreed to before we lodged. And that, that's, that, that certainly is important. Uh, you know, Craig, I, I, I hear Craig touch on Brisbane. I, I have to admit, we um, the industry is probably its own worst enemy when it comes to Brisbane. And, and what I mean by that is, I'll give you an example. Four of my most senior guys, I poach from Brisbane City Council. Now, so what happens, because Brisbane is such a large council, as soon as there's an assessing officer who um, is seen as a bit of a shining light, the industry is very quick to um, poach them. So unfortunately, they do struggle with staff retention there, which causes its own issues in that sense, you know? Uh, so I'll be the first to put my hand up and say, look, we, we cause our own problems by, by doing that. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you sow what you, you reap what you sell, I guess. But the, if you had to find for me an council that was extremely difficult to deal with, and I don't mind saying it, it'd be Toowoomba Council. Uh, the planners are great but the engineers still are very much in a box ticking attitude that they cannot accept that. So as an example, if you have land that falls away from the street, unless you get consent from your rear neighbor, 
the engineers will not let you have any other sort of outcome for storm water. Now we all know the world tips towards the street or the world tips away from the street. So in essence, the engineering approach of get neighbors consent or not sterilizes half the city. And that's been an ongoing issue with Toowoomba city council is the, um, the engineering holds them back, you know, even during the gas field boom where, where Toowoomba was a regional base that still held them back in that sense. So, but look, speaking positively, highlights would have to be Logan and, and Gold Coast for us, at least anyway. Very good. Now, I don't know if I, I noticed a twitch or uh, Adam's eye certainly lit up when he heard you say five-day approval for 200 lots. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I'd have to say from a Queensland perspective, um, yeah. the, I guess the, that whole risk smart process is uh, fantastic. New South Wales has got something similar with um, complying developments with certain uh, development types. Uh, I'm not aware of anything in Victoria that matches the same. Um, so, uh, which brings me to my next question, timelines for approvals, folks. What, what are we seeing around the grounds? Uh, and I'm gonna start with uh, Queensland first and then work south from there. Craig, you want to kick off? Yeah, cool. Um, so we lodge, the, we, we, as, a, as an organisation I mentioned earlier, we typically do the smaller scale type projects. So we lodge the highest number of applications through Risk Smart, which is their fast track program. Um, so yeah, five days, it's, it's typically, it used to be really strictly five days. Um, it's probably bordering more like seven or eight, but still quite fast right now. Um, once you're outside of that paradigm, you, you know, they, they do have this 35 day uh, time frame, but they've got another, another process called Assess Smart. Um, which is for projects which aren't quite suitable for risk smart, still go through pretty quickly. And in fact, in, in some instances, they're nearly going through as quickly as, uh, as risk smart. I, I know, because I've been in New South Wales as well, that all things aside, the processes in Queensland are very fast. And I, you know, whilst this isn't politically uh, motivated, but I think someone in, 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 in the, those spaces should be highly con you know, commended for the, the efforts they put in to make things happen as quickly as they do. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess, and th that's for the risk smart side of things, but what are we seeing uh, with regards to code compliant and then impact accessible yeah. uh, for yourselves, gents? Yeah, so, so, you can answer, yeah. yeah, I guess for us, we, we, we've seen no change in the time for your standard impact and your time for your standard code accessible applications uh, across all councils, that is. Uh, now, some councils are faster than others, but none of them have changed as, as a result of, result of COVID. Oh, no, I'm not talking about in result of COVID. What I'm trying to, to do is a comparison around the country to say how long does it take for an approval at yep, all? I could, so yeah. I, I tell my clients this, if you want an impact DA, that's the uh, advertising the whole process, strap yourself in for nine to 12 months. If yep. you're chasing a code DA, that's not risk smart. If you're chasing a code DA, put, put yourself in for four to six months. Uh, okay. Now, if the projects are, say, housing or whatnot, that's a, that's a different beast altogether. I, I guess I'm talking about your actual hardcore development applications, de developments. Uh, yeah, four to six for code, nine to 12 for impact. No, and we'll see to, no change there. I would say, Vu, just to, to reflect, Rob, Vu and my businesses are quite different. Vu obviously doing the bigger scale projects because when I hear his time frames, I'm like, geez, that's a long time. But because he's doing the bigger projects, mine are smaller scale, we get them through much quicker than that. So I guess it almost relates to what sort of size project. It's like, you can't just talk time frames without talking about the scale. And when talks, yeah. who's talking about 200 lot subdivision, it's different to doing a, a, yeah. a two or a five subdivision. So, yeah. yeah. And it comes back to what I mentioned before. Like, let's say, for instance, if we if um, we had a client who typically did 10 at a time, let's just say he did 10 at a time, 10 packs at a time. And, you know, I said before, the emphasis is on speed now. So rather than strapping ourselves in for a six month battle about site cover, gar landscaping, and car parking, the instruction is get me in and out as fast as possible. So I got to hit the market. So what we're doing is we're bashing his due diligence in the shape. And if it doesn't stack up on a full compliance scenario to enable speed, he drops the site. So we are seeing as our clients pivot towards a speed model, we expect their projects to shorten in time, but not everyone is opting for that model. Oh, good. Uh, so we'll go south, Adam. Yeah, um, we've got the, the compliant development uh, policy, which is a state government um, overarching policy, which has um, kind of low scale development, single dwelling houses, alts and ads. Um, you can do manor houses and dual occupancies. You can do some multi dwelling house um, developments, but with those, the criteria is so constrained, we see very few of them. Um, but that 
that um, CDC uh, process has a statutory 10 day approval time frame. Um, there's probably what that does is push the preparation of the application to a higher degree before it's actually lodged um, so that there's some certainty around dealing with the application. But it, it's a tick the box exercise. Um, so if you have any aspect the development can't comply, as we were saying with one of their criteria, you end up in a DA. Uh, a DA for, say, a moderately contentious house would be in around a three-month kind of bracket. Um, we've got a, a multi-res tower in Toronto that's been in for 12 months. So if you're dealing with, like, say, 40 unit kind of developments, you're in for 12 months. So that kind of range, really, single dwellings can be... It, the single dwellings can go anywhere from two weeks to three months uh, and then ranging up to 12 months. We don't see much go beyond that. But... Yeah. And then uh, I guess lastly, uh, strap yourselves in, folks, for timelines in Victoria because right. uh, my my knowledge of uh, Victoria is, uh, I guess, snail's pace. Um, who wants to go there? Oh, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> No, it depends. Again, it depends on who you're dealing with. Um, look, uh, Melanie and I deal with probably we're in we're both in southeast, but I deal a lot with Glenora, Bayside, Kingston, and Mornington. And I think Melanie, you were saying before, a lot more of the fringe, Casey, Cardinia, plus um, Knox, etc. Um, look, we have a statutory time frame for you know permit uh, planning permit applications. Uh, which is 60 days and councils basically assess themselves on their performance against that. Um, in terms of the four councils like Glenora, Bayside, Kingston and Monash, I can tell that you know, within that 60 days, Bayside are saying, it's saying that they're getting them done on average in 41 days, Glenora in 66, uh, Monash in 74 days and Kingston in 90. Um, so when, uh, Bayside and Glenora are around, well, Bayside's well under and Glenora's just above. Kingston's sort of blowing out a bit at the moment. But that's just the statutory time frame. It's important to dis, uh, distinguish that with how long it actually takes because you've got to allow for advertising and requests for further information and things like that. And um, my, I, I looked at 28 of my permits um, over the last three years, just the other day, and most of them are between four to six months, so very similar to, to the code um, requirement um, that Vu you were talking about. So, um, yeah, but you can have best case and worst case scenarios that can blow those time frames out. But you know, um, there's some very interesting results at the moment, and councils are certainly very focused on getting the best, getting their um, decisions out within those 60 days but it's how long the developer takes to get return you know, information back, mm. what happens during the advertising process, if there's objectors, that can all blow the time on, timeline out and, and Melanie may have some other thoughts. Mm. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, I, I have to talk to people all the time who've just listened, just spoken to a council um, planner and have said, oh, so I can get my permit in two months. And it's like, well, no, you really can't. It's gonna take a lot longer than that. I really wish councils would stop saying 60 days because 60 statutory days is not 60 days. Um, and um, it just it just confuses everybody. But I, I do agree that there is a wide variability. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the nicer, I guess, far, uh, fast track processing that, that you um, guys were, were talking about. Uh, so all of our applications at the moment are just going, you know, through at, at that sort of longer time period. The other, I guess the other issue with, uh, I was going to say, Paul, with, with assess, I mean, it's very interesting to look at the statistics, but that is the whole, generally that's taken of the whole spectrum of their processing of all their applications. And so um, the only issue with that is that obviously it depends on how many, you know, simpler applications are going to go through quickly. Um, and then longer applications are going to take longer. And so that can skew the, the statistics as well. Um, I find that planning applications, I guess, your best case scenario for simpler things are going to be around three months uh, if it needs to be advertised. 
uh, simply because you lose about a month with the advertising, you know, and, and sort of processing of all of that. Uh, so actually, my my all time best was was Glen Ira Council, and it was just under two and a half. It was just under three months, and that included a third, uh, 28 day, or was that time 20? Sorry, 21 day uh, notice period for because it was an objector. So you know you can have yeah good ones like that, and then you can have other things that that can drag on for more than 12 months um, in worst case scenarios. So there is certainly some some variability. Can I say? We've got to watch out also that there's, you know, this 60 days that Melanie referred to and I, I mentioned as well, some planners out there say, right, um, I've got 60 days, uh, you know, so they could probably deal with the application in 30. And I had a situation with a commercial application that could have been dealt with in about 20, 25 to 30 days. She, she basically sent me an, uh, an email this is out of Whittlesea saying everything's right to go. I've just got to uh, write the report up, but I've got until, and this was at the end of April, sorry, end of February. And she says, I've got until uh, mid April. <laughs> I'm like, well, just because you've got the 60 days doesn't mean you have to use the 60 days. Mm -hmm. And and this is again, what it, you've got to really be careful and some different planners can take just, mm -hmm. And it depends on their workload, but mm. I think I really think across planning, it really sounds like the three to six months for, I guess, a non-complex DA is probably pretty consistent. Um, and you can have, you can certainly have uh, you know, improvements, but I wouldn't go in, um, I wouldn't go in under that three months, uh, thinking that you're gonna, yeah, it, it's a pretty, pretty big call if you think. Can about I, it. yeah, sorry, Rob, can I also add uh, for you guys down south? Don't be seduced by the fast track turnaround system we have up here. Okay. Uh, now, what I mean by that is that if you nominate to go through the fast track process with some of these councils, because not all councils have the fast track process, you're essentially volunteering and opting to comply with everything or most things. So if you have a client who wants extra density, extra site cover, less car parking or reduced setbacks, more likely than not, you're not going to actually be able to go through the process. You're going to have to, have to suffer some retraction in yield. So you need to decide at the outset, is the saving of time worth the reduction of the product you're going for? And that's a conversation we have pretty heavily with our clients at the very beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. And pre-COVID, most of our clients opted for the, the long road because we would get extra site cover, extra density, those sorts of things. But I think we'll find that um, as it turns around, we'll probably head towards more of the fast track process. But my point to everyone down south is don't be suckered into the fast track because if you do, uh, which is fine, you just need to do your due diligence based on a very largely compliant project. I'm going I'm to add to that. I'm going I'm to say the reverse. <laughs> I'm going to say... I'm gonna That's say, why I love this process. Yeah, yeah, why not? I could sit here and I'd say really push for it. Because and Vu kind of said this himself, but I would say really push for it because if you can get your your mechanisms in place where those non those fully compliant applications can get forced to go through in five days, like Jane, like Paul said, if it's if it's fully compliant and it's going to go through and there's no real issues with it, and they've got an obligation to get it done in five days, at least it gives them the choice. And and like Vu said, typically we would say to our client, there's two ways to do this: either you can do it fast and compliant, or you can do it slow and get a high high yield or high yield outcome. But I think it's good to have that choice. And I, what I'm hearing in, in the Southern states, they don't actually have that choice where we do yeah. have that choice. So that's what I, that's why I love it because I, I, I give my clients that choice. Mm. Yeah, we I'm do. Gonna... Sorry, Melanie, oh, here you go. All right. I was just going to say that there is one council, uh, Moreland, who uh, have just put in a planning application amendment to um, use what's called, we call it VicSmart. It's a fast track process in Melbourne. And uh, so that essentially it's for dual occupancy or two dwelling uh, mm. developments, which is essentially going to be that. So it's, you know, something that's fully compliant, um, meets a certain number of criteria that they've set, will they'll turn it around within, it's supposed to be 10 working days. So, um, yeah, I think it would be, it would be good to see more of that simply for two reasons. I agree with you, Craig, about the choice. And also I feel like it would give an opportunity to, uh, lighten the load you know if there's you know even if 20 percent of applications can go through at this faster faster that they're not dragging down and so therefore the council uh, system would then have 
faster time to process the other applications. But anyway, Adam, you go ahead and do what you said. Yeah, that. thanks. Um, we we um, have the compliant development criteria. It's pretty limited. But um, what I would say, I'd perceive the problem around here, like say in Sydney or, or the Hunter, um, is that market forces really drive us to optimise our yield at all times. And it's pretty rare um, for us to see a proposal come forward that's light on. Um, pretty well every multi raise project we do, we're leveraging it to the hill, um, arguably over the hill. And oh, I couldn't tell you a project I've seen in recent years where I looked at it and went, that's underdone. Um, it rarely happens. And so I don't know with that market, with property prices the way that they are, I don't know how it would work here. Rob, can I say uh, something more just on this yeah, one? Yeah, go for it. I was going to actually add one that you mentioned before, Paul, so it might be timely. Ah, well, I just simply wanted to say the the the, the issue of whether to go Craig's version or Vu's version, uh, in other words, testing the boundaries or, or, or fully compliant, to me, the bigger picture is you've got to understand the council uh, and their position in regards to the level of compliance. My, my view, and it comes back to this term that a few of the planners on here will probably have used in the past, and that's on balance. And if you can deliver it, what we probably call an on balance uh, compliant application, such that you might have some minor non, non, minor non compliances, but in other areas you've exceeded uh, compliance, then you know, it, you've got to work within the certain policies within each council to understand just what boundaries you're testing and this can actually impact on all of your um your timing so particularly in victoria you know the more you test the boundaries the longer it's going to take and the more the more you risk um the application being refused um and no one you know wants to go to vcat down here and um and so i'd be really mindful that for anyone listening out there to consider that if they're going to push a, a site coverage requirement or versus a front setback or whatever it is, work out firstly what the council's particular position is and what they favour, because I'd be really mindful of that when thinking through a planning application and whether you want it through in four months versus six or, or, or longer. Absolutely. And, and also the commercial reality of what's the extra holding cost going to cost you trying to get that yield and is the, uh, the heartache worth the uplift um, and in many times it's not um, uh, the term highest and best use um, is the most amount of money in the least amount of time with the least amount of hassle um, it's not the most yield and it's not the most money um, it's the velocity of money and actually getting your projects turned over and getting into the next project so I think that's very missed by a lot of people yeah just on that point that I had a client who's a, a career developer. He's, he, he mentored me when I was young, when I first started up my practice 13 years ago. And he said to me, because I was asking him, how does, like, how does he make his money? It was a pretty crude, rude conversation to have with a client. But he was very frank. He was very honest. He said, to make money in development, it, this is his formula. He either had to buy right, plan right, or build right. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, unless you're going to buy it at a good price or get an exceptionally good price, planning approval or get a cheap build price, he has to jag two out of the three to be in the game. So, and I took that on board and I thought, okay, well that changes then for us because if I've got a client who's a builder, he's got one out of the three straight away, right? Um, if I've got a client who's a, a good acquisitions guy, he's got one of the three, which leaves me picking the middle, right? With a plan, right? You've got to get a, an exceptionally good planning approval. So I've just always found that if you're, a, depending on the type of client, they would go over a different path. You know, so if you say, for instance, you had a builder who got a good acquisition, he can afford to fully comply. But if you had a guy who paid a bit slightly a bit overs for the land acquisition, he or she's got no choice but to go hard on the DA. Yeah, and it's, it's different strokes for different folks. But you know, that that's that the whole buy right, plan right, build right, it's just stuck to my mind to this day. Um, it, it seems it, it certainly worked well for, for when I've done my own projects, but it's a uh, it just reminded me that every process is different for everyone. Yeah. Uh, Paul, mate, you showed us something just before we went on air that um, for anyone in Victoria is, is a handy little resource to know. Uh, the old knowyourcouncil.vic.gov.au. Um, 
So I don't know if you want to just do a screen share for like 10 seconds, mate, and just show people what you can get out of it. Um, can you see that? Uh, not yet. You've got oh. to hit the share screen button. Oh, uh, yeah, down the bottom. Sorry. That's the one. So I just, yeah, just for those out there, I just came across this not too long ago, but, and Melanie, you know, you really touched on something important before is we've got to be careful of that 60 days, but this, this website is essentially a comparative website for councils and you can put in all sorts of different um, information. Now, this is just a PowerPoint that I've got here, not the web, not the um, actual website. I won't risk stuffing that up on Facebook and, causing all sorts of grief, but I just snipped some of these slides out um, to give you a feel from a statutory perspective. So that's essentially what the website looks like. Know your council, um, vic, uh, yeah, vic.gov.au. Um, this is the an indication of the statutory time taken that, you know, as I was reading before, um, just to give you a, a bit of a feel. And this is the statutory time being the 60 days, being as the, the key benchmark. And as you can see, Bayside and Glenora, and then Kingston at 90. Um, this is an indication for you guys out there that, okay, um, sorry, that, uh, you know, within that 60 days, 70% of, at Bayside, 70% of applications are being decided within that 60 days. Glenora very close on 70.39 in Kingston obviously dropping down a bit. And then this is an interesting one, Rob, just in terms of the cost of planning service per application. Um, now, exactly what is embedded in that, I'd probably have to- Your just screen hasn't away. moved, Paul, you, to the next one? Hey? Your screen didn't change the next one for the costs? Oh, is it not there? Um, but what, what I was gonna say while we're waiting for the screen to change is, uh, statutory timeline and and not one of them are getting in the 90% mark um, and 70s and below that's not a an overly good statistic yeah it's um as I said Bayside's had some very big improvement Bayside went from a council being very difficult to deal with to being one of the highest performing councils at the moment as a matter of interest yep um, have you got that cost slide now yeah absolutely yeah so you know, the average costs of planning service per application. Now, as I said, I'm not going to go into breaking down what that is, but for, you know, it just goes to show that um, whilst Bayside is the best, it's probably costing people the most. I mean, and some of the planning fees in Bayside, like planning fees are pretty much set across the board for certain types of development applications across Victoria, which is good. But, um, but yeah, it's it's just sort of showing that, you know, when they're looking at the costs of how much a plan is it costing them, et cetera, you can see that um, Bayside being quite an affluent suburb also has the highest cost to, per application. But what I, I think noticed is that, you know, the lower the number of applications a council is getting in, Rob, the more it's costing to do. Uh, so it's more, it's, the more it's costing the councils. Um, which was an interesting, so when they've got heaps of applications, they're bringing the cost of servicing them is coming down. But but again, as I said, I'd, I'd defer to someone just to go to the website and a lot of it is explained within that. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, mate. Appreciate you sharing that. And uh, it would be fantastic for all of the different jurisdictions to have tools like that to be able to see uh, how, how the different um, councils are tracking because I think once it's publicly visible, then they've actually got some, uh, you know, some visibility and, and, and peer pressure from the industry to actually uh, keep to their performances. So, uh, you know, once, even though those are showing 70% now, it's a relatively new resource. I'd say watch this space and watch them actually get uh, incrementally get better over that. Um, so I'd love to see that happen in New South Wales and, and Queensland as well. Um, now I will go back to a question from the the uh, from the community. So Keats asked a question, which uh, is Melbourne specific, but I think applies everywhere. Uh, so looking to buy a subdivision in Kingston Council, uh, should I talk to the council uh, planner first? Um, I'm a builder, but only starting uh, property development myself right now. So first time developer, uh, builder, 
I guess, trying to uh, uplift. Um, should they talk to council? In one word answer, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes. I would have said no. There you go. <laughs> I can't. It's just more information. It doesn't need to say it's going to be right. But yes, yeah. just, just hear what they've got to say. Kingston Council has a pre-development or a pre-application uh, advisory process. Um, you fill in a form. So to your subscriber there, you fill in a form. Um, if you, you know, you can identify the address, what your aspiration with the address is, so what you want to do with it. Now, the way the wording that you gave me then, Rob, was he wants to buy a subdivision, but I'm not sure if he means wants to build and subdivide to or something to that effect. Um, or sub buy a subdivided block, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll, I'll reread his question. Looking at buying and subdivision. So oh, the buy, then right. subdivide, then build. So Okay. So it's buying, yeah, buy and build and subdivision. So this is the sort of thing that, um, yeah, very, as I said, most of us are dealing with this type of side by, a lot of it's now side by side development, particularly in Kingston, Glen Ira, Bayside and a few other suburbs. Um, but yeah, the pre-development advice, I mean, I can assist as well. Happy to take on board, uh, get the phone call and 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 identify some of the issues. Um, but yeah, I'd get the pre-development advice as well. I'd, I'd say mandatory to always talk to your town planner first in every instance. Um, and uh, most of the time the town planner would then say whether or not they advised for that particular site, whether or not a pre-lodgement meeting with council was advised. Um, Pretty sure you'd all be in unison with that one. Yeah, agree. Uh, I guess if I could just add to your comment or your question, Rob, is know your council. Uh, some councils will staff the front, the hotline with the most junior staff, and some councils will staff the hotline with more experienced staff. Uh, so know your council because getting planning advice or a site assessment from a junior council officer may not set you in the right path. Uh, because to be fair, they only look at the planning codes. They may not look at the engineering codes or the pollution codes and whatnot. So to double down, do speak with your consultant planner, but I, I see no harm in talking to council officers. Very good. Now- uh, Can I just we've... add a little bit to that, Rob? Go for it, Adam. Um, yeah. If you're starting out in the game, I think it's probably more important to put a good team around you. Um, so get a good planner, a good engineer, a good surveyor and a good designer. Um, rely on their advice initially um, and, and surround yourself with a good team. And then um, then your consultation with council will be guided by their advice before you even go to council. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Very good. Um, okay, so uh, we have cracked the hour, folks. Uh, so I'm gonna ask one final question uh, in order to exit. If you had a magic wand, what would be the one rule you'd want to change inside uh, which particular council? So we'll start with ladies first, Melanie. If you, what, your magic wand, what would you like to, what would you like to change? Um, Tough. <laughs> one, I guess one one that annoys me is um, Frankston City Council have. This is an internal policy. Uh, it's not written in the planning scheme. They they like to have. 40 square metres of secluded private open space uh, per dwelling, even though it's only 25 is required. So I'd like I'd like them to stop insisting on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a number of councils that have internal political uh, internal policies that don't necessarily apply in code. And I'm sure if people wanted to take them on. Um, that you'd win, but the, the headache is not worth it. So, Paul, yourself, magic wand, mate. Yeah, I, I find that a really tough question. I, I'm not. I don't. I wouldn't make it about prescriptive uh, requirements. I don't think. I. What I demand or what I expect of councils is to have the same level of um, service culture that consultants have. And so, for me. I just want to, and, it, and it's been good to see some really improving. And so my magic wand request would be to see that planners from the, the, the most inexperienced to the most experienced have a, have, a, have a really strong service culture. And if I was to just ask for one thing more of consistency, it would be that team leaders 
once they get their applications, just try and turn them around a little bit quicker because sometimes the officers do a great job to get them to their team leader, but then the team leaders just go, well, I'm really busy and it's just going to take two weeks to get off my desk when it's already done. So anyway, so it's a tricky question though, Rob. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, we'll go up the eastern seaboard, Adam, yourself. Yeah, um, look, I, I constantly get amazed at how obsessive councils are over solar access compliance to private open space areas. And I don't know how this applies in other states, but um, Lake Macquarie, for example, you've got to have three hours of access over 50% of the prescribed POS area. Um, and the council really gets caught up on the square meterage of that. And it, it seems to be universal, but I don't know, I'm pretty fair and in the middle of summer, I don't want to be sitting in a courtyard that's baking in sun. So uh, I, I think as a collective, the industry in New South Wales at least needs to look at how they apply those provisions. Certainly people do want to put amenity within their yard spaces, but I don't think that just this prescriptive square meterage hourly rate thing is quite working. Very good, thank you. Um, Craig? My magic wand would be that council goes beyond the point of ticking boxes, looking for compliances. Um, I get frustrated when we've got some really good justification for why council should look at our performance outcomes and our performance solutions. And they just send a re an information request back that basically just repeats what their code says. That's my frustration. Yep. And lucky last vu. Right, for the magic wand, I would force a job swap. I'd like them to do our job for six months and we do their job for six months. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I said to you before, four of my most senior guys come from council because it's important that my team understand and my clients understand process, but also for council to understand that for every project we put in front of them, we've probably vetoed 10 of them. You know, so even the things we put in front of you might be ambitious. We filtered it for you. The, the 10 that didn't work, you should see them. You know, uh, so I understand where we're coming from, but to be fair on them, we should understand where they're coming from as well. So job swap, guys, is what I'd like to see happen in a magic wand world. Very good. <laughs> uh, well, done that. thank you uh, all for uh, your participation today. It's been greatly appreciated to see what's happening uh, around the grounds, uh, I, I guess, on at least half of the, the country. Um, next time we'll try to get uh, South Australia, WA and Tasmania involved as well, but uh, it takes a while to get through one question when we've got this many on here, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, very much appreciated. Thank you uh, for everyone in the crowd with the, the questions that have actually come through. Uh, for those of you uh, where this is your first time actually uh, joining us, we actually run these Sunday sessions every single Sunday at five o'clock. Uh, different topic every single week. There's not always a panel, but uh, it's usually the mussings of Rob uh, talking about the good, the bad and the ugly that's happening in the industry for whatever is topical at that point in time. Uh, and uh, with that said, folks, uh, we also run a Facebook community uh, and also an off-market deal site community, uh, so development site deal hub. So if you uh, aren't already a member of those, very much uh, encourage you to join those. So thank you. Uh, to, uh, to Melanie uh, from uh, Change of Plan, from Paul from Gem Plan, uh, Adam from Piper Planning, Vu from Town Planning Alliance, and Craig from ASI Planning. So thank you all, folks, uh, and very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Kim. Now, just end the meeting. I think.